find the text tonight in Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12. Thank you, Brother Bowl. It's a good song. Sister Joanne will play. Genesis chapter number 12. which occupy the West Bank at this time or live there. 
and have settled there. In eastern Jerusalem, you've got about 200,000 Jews that live there and have settled there. You've got, uh, uh, you've got folks like, uh, I believe his name's Ron Emanuel, who's a Jew who was bought, brought up in Israel, who can speak Hebrew, and he is, uh, he is uh, there, uh, one of the cabinet, or I, I don't know what you call it, I can't remember what his position is. Pray for the night church, I've got Ruth and others on my mind. But uh, uh, anyways, Ron Emanuel, he is, he is one of, uh, let me put it this way, the president's right-hand man. And then also you've got a man by the name of George Mitchell. And those two will sit across the table from uh, Iran's leaders, from the uh, European uh, Union, from the UN. Uh, they'll sit across from Iran. Uh, they sit across from these other uh, politicians and dignitaries and leaders in this other country. And if you want peace with between Israel and Iran and Lebanon and Turkey and Egypt and all these other places, then the Jews that have settled uh, in the West Bank and the Jews that have settled around Hebron, now I'm telling you, Hebron is a godly, one of the oldest cities, a sacred place. That's where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. And so it is important to the Jewish people. And many are settled there. But the Palestinian folks don't want the Palestinian folk don't want Jews in Bethlehem. Uh, and so they said, get them out of, out of the Palestinian area and everything will be alright. I'm telling you, nothing's ever going to be alright. As long as, uh, as long as the devil's alive and roaming the earth and seeking an inmate of hour, and as long as the Palestinians and the Muslims and the Shiites and the Sunnis and the Jews and, and Christians and Catholics and uh, Buddhists
Now the Lord says, I'm going to promise you land and it's, it's unconditional and it's literal and it's eternal. It's always going to be their land. And so we talk about the promise, but then I want to talk about the prophecy. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 9. Now you've heard me preach this scripture, and a lot of times I preach it as encouraging. You know, I say, well, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Government should be upon his shoulder. And I, I, you've heard me preach this, that uh, while the government and everybody else's problems and everybody else's issues is on one shoulder of the Lord, you can lay your hand on the other, and that just makes for good preaching. But if we see for how it's literally written, the Bible says in Isaiah 9, at verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon the kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He's saying that there's going to be one that's coming that will fulfill the promise, that will bring, listen, I know that Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not, and yes, he died for the Gentile, and he died for the Jew, and he died for the Palestinian, and he died for Muslims, hey, red, yellow, black, and white, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He died for the entire world. And it's not that, yeah, they say, well, he's supposed to come and set up his kingdom, but he didn't do it then. He still had work that had to be done. He had to die on the cross of Calvary. He had to, he had to be born. He had to live a perfect life. He had to die. He had to uh, be buried. He had to rise again. He's in heaven. But one day, the kingdom, amen, one day, there'll be, now listen, there's already a replenishing. There's already a flourishing going on. But one day, And the Lord will be the cause of it all. See, he comes into an Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 and Genesis 17. And I know right now you may say, he is all over the place and this is confusing me. It's going to come together at the end. Study it. I told myself crazy. He comes into Abrahamic covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 through 10. He comes into a Palestinian covenant. And 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16, he comes into a Davidic covenant. He talks about land. He talks about seed. But he tells them in Ezekiel chapter 36, he says, Also the Son of Man prophesy unto the mount of Israel and say, Ye mount of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord of God, because they have made you desolate, swallowed you up on every side, that you might be a possession of the residue of the heathen. You are taken up in the lips of talkers, talkers and are an infamy of the people. Therefore ye mount of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the rivers, to the valleys, to the desolate wastes, to the cities that are forsaken, which became and pray in derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about you. He says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen, against uh, all the uh, uh, dubia, uh, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart and the spiteful minds to cast it out for prey. He said, and verse 7, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I have lifted up my hand. So the heathen that are about you, they shall bear their shame. But ye, O mountain of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches, yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. He said to the mountains, to the rivers, to the streams, to the valleys, he said, I'm going to bring fruit, I'm going to bring uh, uh, replenishing, I'm going to bring life, hey, I'm going to bring revival to you, man. And he does. And right here, this is just one plain outside of Nazareth. All the vineyards, the cultivation, and all these things that are taken outside of the dead city. They're finding, they're finding plants and fruits and vegetables growing where there's always been desolate land. 
John Deere tractors are. Hallelujah for John Deere tractors. And we're still supplying them, praise God. But he said, I'm going to bring life. But more important than the land, he said, I want to focus on the people. He said, those that are going to come back. Now, if you would, Brother John, I came across something in my studies, and, and I'm going to quit with this. I talked about the promise to the land. And by the way, they're coming home even right now. Millions every day, since returning home to Israel. I know Sister Judy follows uh, Israel and what's going on and I do and others. We email one another and send things to one another and millions, millions. Brother Brad, the year that I went to Israel, like 1.5 million Jews returned within a couple of months. Just amazing. I was reading in my study about all these people coming home. The promise of the land. And I was going to end with the promise and with, with the prophecy and how it was literal and how it was eternal and how it was unconditional. Can I tell you this? Every promise that God has made to you, if it hasn't been fulfilled, it's going to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. He said He'll never leave you, He'll never forsake you. That's a promise. He said, I'm going to prepare a place. I'm coming back. That's a promise. He said, if we come to Him, He would not cast us out. That's a promise. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. The promise to Abraham, He fulfilled. The promise to David, He fulfilled. The promise to Ezekiel, He fulfilled. All these promises have been fulfilled. And I began to research, Brother Bo, and began to study, and I began to read about these six men just in the history of Israel. And, 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 I, and maybe nobody else would have seen this, but I got to thinking how the Lord, back Sister Billy, when he had people pinning these words down, Brother Floyd, he knew who the leaders were going to be. Amen. And who needed to be in place to bring Israel back into the nation. Now, the first one you have over here is who? Well, this guy. I don't know if that's my right. I guess that's my right. Theodore Herzl, in 1897, was one of the founding fathers of the Zionist movement. He seen people coming against Israel. He seen, he seen Israel, high, high anti-Semitism, all these things. He seen hatred of the Jews all throughout the world. Did you know? Did you know that not everybody in America likes Jews? They lived in Russia. Russians hate Jews. They lived in Germany. Germans hate Jews. Boy, we know about the Holocaust. Six million killed. They lived in France. Now, and hey, people rejected them everywhere they went. But yet there was still a remnant of those that loved them. And this man, he had a bird. God put it on his heart as a 15-year-old boy. God, Theodore Herzl, went research some of these men, if you want to write them down. He had a bird that the children of Israel might be able to come back to the land that God promised them. Secondly, there's a man by the name of Edmund James de Rothschild in 1903. And God used him as a, not, I don't want to say extremist, but God, he had a burden for Israel. He had began to write, uh, there, he began to write Britain and began to write France and began to write these other countries. Saying, if you get the word out to the children of Israel and to the Jews that live in your countries and in your cities and in your area and tell them that there's a home that's going to be opened up to them. These people never lost the burden, never stopped praying, never lost their, there was a desire in their heart to come home. I share with couple months back about Ezra, our bus driver in Israel. How his family, after hundreds of generations, have lived in the same area. Brother Mike sold everything, moved off, and moved into Petra. And they said, we don't understand why we moved to Petra, but God put it on our hearts to do. I know why. And you Christians know why. And then the third man is Lord Arthur James Belfort. 
1917. And if you would, Brother John, this man, the third man, and this man right here, a great leader in the Israeli army, he was Sir Edmund Allenby. And many history fans, listen, I had a history teacher, a good history teacher. Miss Williams was a good Christian woman. And she said, all history is his, his story. I've never forgot that. And when I, I thought about that today, Brother Bo, I thought all of history is his story. You've got this man come on the scene and during 1917, and all those that were in the Palestinian state, and all those that were in Israel, they came in, they won the battle, they put them on, they put them on the run. And this man created the roadway system and the bridges and here's the Allenby Bridge we crossed that if you would Brother John we crossed that to get into Jordan that's the bridge now it's the King Hussein Bridge but to, the, to the Muslims to those who live in Jordan but to the Jews it will always be the Allenby Bridge and then Brother John if you would there's two more that come to play that, that man in 1917 and this man at an early age his name is David Ben Gurd. In 1943, he became Israel's first prime minister. And they came in to Israel and they won the, they won the battle. And he proclaimed Israel as a state and as a nation. Now, not everybody like President Harry Truman. I think that I talked about, I can even remember, I, he talked about the D, the D and B or did something. I can't remember what he called there in Korea. That boy wasn't a big fan of his. But I'm telling you, he had enough history and he had enough upbringing about the Word of God. It was quoted in some of his speeches. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and Deuteronomy chapter 10 saying the Jews ought to have their own country and ought to have their own land. They ought to be given the right to live there. And as soon as the Prime Minister of Israel declared them as a nation, President Harry S. Truman also brought in that. He said, Israel is a nation. Israel is a country. I'm talking 5,000 years ago. God said, six me and put them in a timeline and said, I'm going to use these six to bring my people home. And since 1960 years now, since 70 A.D. till 1948, none of them lived there. But the last 60 years, they've been coming in by the roads. And all of Israel's their land. It's not the Palestinians and the Palestinian and the Muslim. It's the Jewish people. Amen. Right. And the Bible says one day. Jesus is going to come on the scene. Now I know we're going to be raptured out of here, and I know I know there'll be folk left behind. The church won't be here during that tribulation, and there'll be somebody come on the scene and have all the answers, and the Antichrist to come on the scene, and the false prophet, and all these, the mark of the beast, all these different things are going to take place. We won't be here for none of that. But there'll be the Bible says in Revelation that a hundred. Four thousand Jewish men. Those are not Jehovah's Witness. Those are 144,000 Jewish men that have not defiled themselves. And they preach not the gospel of Christ. That's what I'm doing right now. That's what Brother Bill labors for and Brother Sam and Jack and Grady and Rodney and Tommy. We're preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, salvation, full and free. But they're going to preach the gospel of the soon coming kingdom. They're going to be warning the Jews, hey, get around, the Messiah's coming. He's coming to set up his kingdom. And you know what the Muslims have done? I showed you a picture not long ago. They built that eastern gate. Oh, brother, both we put up enough concrete. They said, if we put up enough concrete, Jesus can't come in. Hey, there ain't no concrete going over there. Amen. Is a Muslim cemetery. The Orthodox Jew 
Jesus is going to lead him right through the middle of it. And, and Ezekiel, he prophesied. He said, there's going to be revival in the land. But in Ezekiel 37, and I'm done, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord. He set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them round about. And I know, Brother Sam, this is a good revival message. But it says, He caused me to pass by them round about. Behold, there were very many in an open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again, He said to me, Prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. He's talking about the Jews that are alive today over in Jerusalem. They have not recognized Jesus as Savior. They, have, they don't even believe that He's come yet. But one day, one day, there's going to be a fresh breeze from yonder country. And my covenant they break 
although I was a husband unto them, said the Lord, but there shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward hearts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. He talks about a new heaven. He talks about a new earth. He talks about a new Jerusalem. He says, I'm the other. I'm the man. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. He said, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. That's exciting to me. That thrills my heart. I pray that this would not bore anybody tonight. I, I pray that somebody... But I, I got to thinking, I thought, we can't, I can't preach on prophecy and not bring Israel into it. It all, listen, it all has to do, all the land and riches and all and all that. Now, no, it all has to do with the Bible. Being fulfilled. And it will be. And in just a little time, we're going home. And I'm excited. I'm excited. With every head, all, with all eyes closed and heads back. Church, we need to continue to pray for, for lost people. That God will work on their hearts. And we need to pray for Jews. That the Jews will be saved. Yeah, there will be some saved after the rapture, but I'd like to see some saved right now. We need to pray for them. We have a listen, and we do need to pray for peace. But this is what I'm praying that the Prince of Peace come very quickly. Amen.